Okay, well, I just, I think we'll, we'll get started. I just want to welcome everyone to today's event uh, in the Russia's Worlds lecture series on the Russian Empire and the Ottoman world uh, with Eileen Kane and Vladimir Hamatryansky. Uh, this is the third event in the Russia's World series, a six part virtual lecture series on the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union in international and global context presented by the Harriman Institute over the course of this year. Uh, so far in the series, we've had events on Russian Empire and the formation of international law, military law, uh, and on the Soviet relationship with East Asia, specifically China and Japan. And we have three more events uh, between now and April, which uh, maybe Carly, the administrator, will, will put into the chat so you can see them. Um, I want to thank the Harriman Institute for making this possible and also thank Carly for, for organizing all of this. Today, unfortunately, my, my co-organizer and co-moderator, Azat, can't be with us, um, but we will go ahead anyway. So for today's event on the Russian Empire and the Ottoman world, we're joined by Eileen Kane and Vladimir Hamadryansky. Eileen Kane is Associate Professor of History and the, rector, the Director of the Global Islamic Studies Program at Connecticut College. Her first book, Russian Hajj, Empire and the Muslim Pilgrimage to Mecca, published in 2015 by Cornell University Press, was about Russia's sponsorship of the Hajj between the 1840s and 1920s. She has a new book of primary sources coming out soon from Oxford University Press called Russia and the Arab World, a documentary history, which she created and co-edited with Margaret Litvin and Masha Gerasirova. This year, she's on leave with the support of a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, working on a book that looks at mass Jewish and Muslim immigration from Russia to the Middle East between the 1840s and the 1940s. And today her talk will focus on migrations as a way to understand connections between Russian and Ottoman history. Vladimir Hamatryansky is Assistant Professor of Global Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He's published articles in the International Journal of Middle East Studies and Comparative Studies in Society and History. And today he will be talking about his forthcoming book project, Empire of Refugees, North Caucasian Muslims and the Late Ottoman State, which investigates the origins of organized refugee resettlement in the Middle East, focusing on Muslims from Russia's mountainous North Caucasus region, uh, over a million of whom fled to the Ottoman Empire between the 1850s and the First World War. And I should add that both Eileen and Vladimir are former Harriman Fellows, so bringing them back to the fold. Um, uh, here. So just a, a note on the format. Um, <clears throat> both Eileen and uh, Vladimir will uh, give presentations. Um, and then I will sort of facilitate a discussion between the two of them uh, about how their work speaks to each other and sort of larger considerations of their work. And then I will open it up to a Q&A uh, from the audience. As uh, the event goes on, please feel free to put questions into the Q&A feature of the Zoom, and then I will see them and uh, I will read them during the Q&A portion of the event. Uh, and you can put them in as they come to you or, or once we get to that section of the event. So uh, with that, I will turn things over to Eileen Kane. Thank you, Sam. Um, and I, we were going to call up a map, I think, at the very beginning, if that's... Sure, yeah, I'll put that up now. Mm -hmm. um, just to start to help everyone kind of get their geographical bearing, and we kind of flipped the, um, the order. We thought it might be nicer if, like, I'll kind of give a broad... Um, I'm going to talk about this first book that Sam mentioned and give a broad discussion of Russia and part of the Ottoman world, the, the Arab world, um, and then uh, hear about a sort of a more specific story from, from Vladimir who's gonna talk about his new monograph. Um, so thank you again to Sam and Azad for inviting me to take part in this series and for everyone for tuning in today. Um, this invitation caught me at a good moment because I'm at the tail end of a book as Sam mentioned, this book, Russia and the Arab World, a documentary history is coming out um, in 2022 from Oxford University Press. And I'm eager to share with you today some things about this book, where it comes from, 
how it can help us think about uh, the overlapping or shared histories of Russia and the Ottoman world, and also what it reveals about the field that I think we can say by now we have that has taken shape um, 30 years since the collapse of communism from new scholarship that tries to bring together, successfully does bring together um, Russian and um, the histories, modern histories of Russia in the Middle East. So a few observations, I thought, to start things off. The Russian Empire and the Ottoman world, this is this headline that we're operating under today, this sort of organizing headline, it's very broad and kind of amorphous. And so let's begin by breaking things down a bit. Who is interested in framing history in this way? And what kind of work is being done? I think that generally there's been uh, more interest in studying these two, and again, I'm thinking, looking back on the last 20 or 30 years, uh, more interest in studying these two empires together and thinking about what they have to do with one another historically coming from the Russianist side uh, among those training in Russian history. I'd love to hear if others disagree with this. We can talk about this more in the Q&A, but these, I was just thinking of this as I was putting this talk together that, and also writing this, this compiling this book, that that seems to be true. Um, there is more interest, I think, in finding Russia in the Ottoman Empire than the other way around. Um, I'm not entirely sure why this is, uh, but I think of it, uh, this sort of just came to me yesterday as I was working on this talk, as related to the term Eurasia which came to replace, as, as we know, uh, Soviet after the collapse of the Soviet Union and our renaming of our professional organization, again, on the Russianist side. I think Mesa has long been Mesa, but we went through some changes in the last 30 years. Um, so AAAS became ASIS, and that acronym now contains Eurasia. Um, scholarly journals and research institutes and area studies programs at universities, Eurasia came to replace Soviet. <clears throat> and we Russianists in the US, we may not all agree. I was sort of talking about this on Facebook with colleagues the other day. What does Eurasia make? I mean, total range of responses about what this term means. So we don't necessarily agree on what it means, but I think the term was meant to, and it continues to productively push us to think about and write Russian and Soviet history beyond the capitals and, and the Russian and Slavic speaking peoples and to center this history around other peoples and places. And so these ongoing revisionist efforts, especially when they focus on Armenians, Jews, Muslims, and Orthodox Christians, they quite naturally draw Russianists into Ottoman territory and history. So I guess, um, you know, as I was thinking about this, the unsettledness, maybe some would say the vagueness of the term Eurasia um, and what it means geographically may actually be stimulating and, and may actually be a productive thing that we don't seem to have it kind of nailed down. Um, but there's this sense that we there's something else we should be doing and revising. Um, and I think that's productive. Um, in terms of geography, most scholarship that we would put under the heading of Russia and the Ottoman Empire, and maybe also most courses taught on this subject, if there are such things, uh, they tend to focus more on the Balkans and Anatolia with much less attention to the Arabic speaking world that the Ottomans also ruled from the 16th through the early 20th century. Um, so the funny thing is that there is by now quite uh, a bit of new work on Russia and the Arab world, but it's spread among different disciplines and scholars working on parallel subjects that should be intersecting, but are kept hidden from one another by how we organize ourselves around journals and conferences and departments. And so this was a goal of this book I'm finishing now, um, this source book, um, to illuminate the, the rich multidimensional history of Russia and the Arab world in the modern era by pulling together some of the best recent work on this subject across disciplines and using it to map out the major themes, issues, and events that have connected these world regions and that structure and I would say give coherence to what we can call their modern shared history. The book is an anthology of primary sources translated for the first time into English from Arabic, Armenian, Persian, Russian, and Turkish and it covers roughly two centuries. So it starts in the 1770s and ends in the 1990s. And I think um, I should definitely clarify at this point that this, this book is not simply my own, but it's a collaborative project. Um, as Sam mentioned in the introduction, I, I, I co-dreamed it up and I'm co-editing it with Margaret Liefen. 
uh, scholar of Arabic and uh, comparative literature, and historian Masha Kira Sirova. And the raw, this is also very important, the raw material of the book, we have about 30 short chapters, each with an essay that contextualizes a primary document, is the work of an international group of art historians, political scientists, historians and literature scholars that includes my co-presenter today, Vladimir Hamid Tryansky, who wrote a fascinating piece on the negotiations surrounding the population transfer of Muslim Chechens from the Caucasus to Ottoman Syria in the 1860s. So uh, collaborative, not, as I say, not just my own book, but all these people are involved in making this, this wonderful thing that we're, we're finishing up now together. So on to the book. The, the history that we tell through 30 short chapters is organized around three broad themes. Infrastructure and institutions, religious, educational, and cultural entanglements, and migrations and borderland peoples. And these are the organizing themes that revealed themselves eventually to us over these past few years of gathering together and reading through the work that scholars have been producing. Um, it started, I guess, 2017. Uh, Margaret Liefen organized, and Sam and I just discovered this is where we first met, um, uh, a, a workshop at BU on Russia and the Arab world. So it was a smaller group of people and it's grown. So we've been working on this now for uh, almost, yeah, about four years. Um, so my point is that, so we didn't just impose these, these three themes um, on our contributing scholars and say, could you write up things along this you know, just to give you a sense, as I said, of where this book comes from, but we instead let the work that we were gathering together from colleagues reveal these patterns to us. Um, and so let me, in my remaining time, give a brief sketch. Um, there's some loose ends here, some, some few ragged edges maybe, but I'm in sort of the midst of revising the introduction um, for the press. And um, what I tried to do was just sort of pull out, it won't capture everything or all the wonderful chapters, but I wanted to give you a sketch of the, the kind of narrative we've, we've um, managed to put together, um, we've created and some of the highlights from it, touching on these three themes. Again, infrastructures and institutions, entanglements um, and migrations. So to start with infrastructure institutions, uh, we start the book chronologically in the 1770s. Historians rightly see the um, 1774 Treaty of Kachukainarja, which ended six years of war with the Ottomans as Russia's emergence as a mighty European empire to rival Britain and France. So the treaty opened the, Rus the Ottoman empire up wide to Russia. I think we can say. It ended Ottoman control of the Black Sea and it gave Russia its lush northern shores, which in keeping with the day's colonial trends were quickly rechristened or christened um, New Russia. So here we think New England, New France, this was kind of the trend of the time. So uh, these northern shores become New Russia. Ambiguously and with important consequences over the 19th century, the treaty recognized Russia's authority as protector of Christians under Ottoman rule. This again will be, every Russianist knows this, and this comes up um, invariably in surveys of the modern Middle East as this is sort of, Russia has arrived, Russia is going to um, start inserting itself into um, Ottoman affairs and this issue of it being protector of Christians. Um, is part of this treaty. The treaty also gave Russia permission to open consulates all across the Ottoman Empire. It, uh, rather vaguely, it said wherever it had interests. And it gave Russian consuls the authority to extend extraterritorial privileges to Tsarist subjects in Ottoman lands. These are known as capitulations, these privileges. The British had been enjoying them and the French for many centuries already. Um, and they weren't just concessions. Um, for Russian subjects, um, in this case, they also, as, as I say, allowed Russia to actually build institutions, um, open up consulates on the ground across the Ottoman Empire. And Russia gets to work on this immediately after 1774, um, establishing a network of consulates, including in the Arab lands. Between, so starting between the 1770s and 1830s, rather quickly, Russia sets up a constellation of consulates in Alec in Alexandria, Aleppo, Beirut, Cairo, Damascus, Haifa, and Jaffa, um, officially to protect its subjects moving to these places as merchants and pilgrims. So this is the interest that it has. It says we have merchants, you know, they don't specify how many, they, but we have people moving through these places, so we need these, these consulates. 
um, Jerusalem. They're kind of clustered around trading ports and near the city of Jerusalem, which was a focus for Russia, um, which had in mind um, from the very beginning uh, and talked a lot about Orthodox pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but the Ottomans kept um, Jerusalem closed for religious reasons to European consulates until um, at least Russia doesn't go in until the 1850s. I think the British are there are there before, but um, so this is they keep them out for a while, and so Beirut is the next best thing. It's it's the um, diplomatic hub for Europeans at this time, and it's close to Jerusalem. Um, so they give Russia a physical ground presence, as I said, in the Ottoman world um, that it will then use in a number of ways to manage and advance its internal and external imperial agendas. So these two things are, are connected. It makes creative use of them as a base for activities that its imperial rivals, Britain and France, are also pursuing the Arab lands. Things like spying on one another, developing trade relationships, conducting ethnographic work on so-called natives, looting manuscripts from monasteries and cultivating allies or trying to among the ethnically and religiously diverse population. Uh, in terms of power politics, some scholars have, have talked about this, Russia's use of con consulates, um, not just Russia, but, but others also to extend protection um, as, a, as, as a kind of effort to cast, uh, this is Lauren Benton's um, phrase, um, shadows of sovereignty into the lands of others. Um, these consulates, so this is really interesting to me and something that, that we um, bring out in the, well, the contributions help us to articulate and bring out in this book. Um, they deepen Russia's understanding of what's going on in its own new borderlands in the Caucasus and how they were connected to parts of the Arab world through ac economic activity, religious networks, and migrations of different kinds. So for instance, the Russian, Russian officials in Baghdad, where they open a consulate in the 1880s, they kind of get there and they discover and try to get in on the trade they had discovered circulating between the South Caucasus and Iraq. Um, they know there are all these reports they're sending back um, as soon as the consulate opens and they note in particular there's a lucrative lambskin trade between Karbala and spots in the South Caucasus. Um, so they're they're discovering what they're they're claiming as their interests. Um, so they conquer the Caucasus and they start by opening these consulates abroad, getting a sense of what kind of trade is going on between the Caucasus and parts of the Arab world, um, and then try to get in on this um, and profit from it. Russia's opening of consulates in Jeddah in 1891 and Basra in 1900, as Masha Kirasirova and I will discuss in one of the chapters in the book, um, they aim to facilitate not only the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca in the case of Jeddah, but also to push deeper into the Arab lands um, to develop trade. Uh, in the early 1900s, Russian exports to Iraq include sugar, matches, porcelain plates, and especially kerosene, which continued to be exported into the early Soviet era. In fact, prior to the discovery of petroleum reserves on the Arabian Peninsula, the largest single Soviet export to the Arab world was Russian gasoline and kerosene that was refined in Baku and shipped by steamship via Batum. So as human movement between Russia and the Ottoman Arab world accelerated in the late 19th century, this is happening, of course, globally. Um, and this is part of, I would say, also one of the things we were thinking about with this book is that there's this sort of missing piece of global history um, that we're kind of filling in by, by revealing how these two places, world regions were connected. Um, and as Russia gained a better sense of connections between peoples and places in Arab lands and Russia's own borderland populations, uh, Armenians and Georgians, Jews and Turkic speaking Muslims, Russia expanded its consular network. Uh, it was between the 1880s and the early 1900s that Russia opened its consulate, not only in Jeddah and Basra, but also Baghdad and Yanbu and a vice consulate in Karbala. Not coincidentally, it was also in the 1880s that the Russian government assisted and soon officially sponsored what was called the Imperial Orthodox Palestine Society, IOPS, which built its own institutional presence and sprawling school network in the Arab world that I'll say a little more about um, in a moment. Um, but if you've ever been to Jerusalem, um, you've seen what they call um, the Russian compound. And this is, uh, 
they began building this in the 1860s. It's right outside the old, the old city walls. And the photograph on the flyer for this event is of um, a hospital that was part of this compound. So they built this compound in Jerusalem of buildings, uh, various buildings. And if you, know, if you think of the entire IOPS presence by um, the eve of World War I, it apparently was as many as 110 maybe more, that's the estimate, I've seen as high as 117 little schools all over um, places we know today as Lebanon, Syria, Israel, Palestine, some of them in tiny villages. So we wanna think about this also as an institutional um, presence and, a, and an infrastructure. So moving on now to entanglements, I'm just looking at the time to make sure I'm not gonna go over. Um, uh, Entanglements, we want to think of these are how institutions were used, the kinds of religious, cultural, and educational dynamics and results they produced. So very simply, the institutional and diplomatic frameworks that I've just described created, um, we could think of them as tracks for enterprising individuals of various backgrounds and affiliations to move along between Russia and the Ottoman Arab world. I guess I would say three points about this. Um, one, they were it was a multi-confessional group of people who did this. It wasn't just one group. Um, Russia tried, that's one, two, Russia tried to produce certain connections and movements. So it's not just that people spontaneously move once the tracks were laid. Russia also tried, and I'll say something really interesting in a moment about this from one of our contributors to get people, okay, now that the tracks are there, now we want you to move and we want this movement because we want to produce or benefit from it in ways. Um, and also these things went both ways. So Russia's, Russians, of course, went into Arab lands, but it also went the other way. Um, so I'll say a bit more about these three things. Um, much of 19th century Russian expansion into the Ottoman Empire proceed, proceeded under the banner of protecting orthodoxy. Again, the slogan, um, you know, open any book on, on you know, survey of the modern Middle East and you'll, you'll, this will be there. Um, uh, this was a cause that, that Russia would push to the limit, of course, in the mid 19th century, setting off the Crimean War. But several chapters in this book um, sketch a more complex picture of late Tsarist Russia's opportunistic relationships through its subject populations, including its Jews and Muslims. In 1839, Tsar Nicholas I ordered the opening of the Russian consulate in Beirut. As I mentioned, this was a hub of European diplomatic activity at the time. Um, and the closest Russia could get to Jerusalem. Um, I'm looking at the time, Sam, can you tell me how I'm doing time-wise? Because I'll make a decision based on that. I think you're okay. You could, you could maybe five more minutes or so. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, um, I'll, okay. Um, so the consulate opens and the idea, the, here's the main point. The idea is to go in and protect orthodoxy and to protect um, orthodox Christian pilgrims and expand Russia's presence there. They, they discover, um, the first consul discovers that in fact, um, uh, local clergy don't want Russian help often. Um, they resent Russian interventions and there aren't actually all that many Russian Orthodox pilgrims showing up. Um, by contrast, there are, are a lot of Muslims and Jews, at least one historian, Alex Carmel, um, uh, the late historian who wrote uh, a lot about Haifa, um, he wrote um, in the 1980s, and I think this deserves further scrutiny that, um, you know, there's almost a way in which writing about Russia as being in Palestine through its Orthodox populations, it sort of kept hidden this other story about Jewish migrants, because he claims that as of the 1830s or 1840s, the largest group of Russian subjects there were in fact Jews. Um, so some of these people actually show up um, at the Russian consulate they um, start um, making demands of the Russian consul to protect their rights. The Russian consul fills some, this is a, um, a, an entry that I contribute to the book. Um, so, you know, he's sort of ambivalent or, or not sure about how to, how to um, deal with this because they want to have, um, they're trying to establish ties with the Orthodox church. Um, but they also have these populations that are that are asking them for help and that seem to exist in in, in sizable um, or considerable numbers. Um, so why is this interesting? One of the reasons this is interesting, I think, is that decades before organized Zionism, these documents from 
um, the Beirut consulate sh show an early pre-Zionist wave of Russian Jewish immigration to Ottoman Palestine in response to um, possibly, I can't say for sure, I mean, this. I'm sort of working on this now and looking more into the reasons that made people move, but deteriorating conditions of life for Jews in Russia. I mean, this is the period when Jews are, are start to be forcibly conscripted into the army. Um, there, this is much smaller than later waves that begin in 1882, but they're they're still significant. Um, and 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 this is also very interesting. These communities. Um, Russia kind of lets them go. They've overstayed their passports. Um, many of them become come under British um, protection, but there's regret about this later. And this is one of the documents that um, I translate and present in the book where they say, you know, that was actually a mistake. These people are very useful to us precisely for the reason that they're, sus they're under um, suspicion in the Russian empire. They have global networks. They're connected to a lot of foreign money. They know everyone. Um, and so what makes them suspect in the Russian Empire makes them useful in the um, Ottoman Empire. And there's um, a discussion in the 1850s after the Crimean War about how it was a mistake to let them go. And what we should really do is, is plant some rich Russian and Polish Jews in Palestine who can help spy on the British for us. Um, so it's this, you know, interesting um, you know, there's, I'm thinking of Eric Lohr's book on, on Russian citizenship about how there are populations that they don't want in the empire and they want to let them go. And this is an interesting case of, well, they, they also kind of want to hold on to them and maintain connections to them if they're useful to them in, um, in, in a place like the Arab world in this period. Um, I'm going to skip some things because I don't want to take up too much time. And I frankly want to hear what Vladimir has to say. I'll just, um, I think do two more things if I, if I have time for that, Sam, do you think a few more minutes? Okay. Uh, so I, one of the most interesting parts of the book, I think is, and this gets at this issue of um, how um, ties are, um, have to be kind of, uh, ties that we think of as, as being historical have to actually be manufactured. This common sense will tell us this. People aren't born feeling a yearning to go to Jerusalem if they're Christian. There's something that produces that yearning. But Elena Astafyeva, the um, historian in, in the book, presents this amazing essay um, where she shows just how um, Russia, uh, the IOPS in Russia tries to make pilgrims uh, sorry, make Russian peasants into pilgrims, make them want to visit Jerusalem and also um, make Jerusalem central to their understanding of Russian Orthodoxy. Um, so she has these documents that she found, uh, you know, very quickly, you'll see when, when the book comes out um, and you read her entry, but they, they would, so also we wanna think about the IOPS as having this institutional presence and infrastructure in the Arab world, but also in, in the Russian empire. Um, so they open branches in Russian towns and villages everywhere. And then they have these things called, this is what she writes about, it's, it's totally fascinating, um, reading meetings. And they, um, and this is not small scale at all. So they hold these reading meetings between, for 1902 and three alone, they held 30,000 meetings in 5,000 locales in the Russian empire, attended by more than 5 million people. Um, they sent out 1,333,750 mass produced publications to branches across Russia, 49,210 copies of a publication called Readings on the Holy Land, which is supposed to tell peasants about the Holy Land and how to think about it. Um, and 640,000 plates of images and pictures of the Holy Land and this I had to look up and learn all about using these magic lantern displays, which is basically the precursor to the overhead projector. So they would gather these peasants together for these reading meetings and have these sort of overhead projector. They had these images and they were all the same. Like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you know, everywhere you went, it was like there was a script they were supposed to follow. So she gives us also a um, uh, translation of something called rules for organizing and leading readings about the Holy Land. Um, these get sent out to the leaders of these, these meetings, and they're told not only how to organize a reading meeting, put the cup here right by the door for the donations, um, you know, how the whole room is supposed to look, um, but they also give instructions on the kinds of emotions they should try to arouse and how exactly to do this. 
to carry out the mission of showing the sad state of orthodoxy in the Holy Land and to possess the hearts of Russians and to prepare for the triumph of orthodoxy, leaders of reading meetings were supposed to appeal to their listeners' imaginations and help them see, hear, and feel the Holy Land. Um, so, you know, both ways, like the this sort of institutional presence is, is not just in the Arab world, it also has a corollary in, in, in the Russian empire. Um, and again, you know, this should, common sense would tell us this, that like Orthodox connections to the Holy Land didn't just come from nowhere, where they weren't, people weren't born with these, but here she shows us exactly how they're trying to, um, it seems with, with some success, um, create them. I am afraid of going over, so I'm going to skip over a lot of stuff that um, I can certainly, if there are loose ends, things I promised to do that I haven't, I'm certainly happy to talk about that in the q and I just wanted to uh, make two final points. Um, I don't want to go into the Soviet period because, our, though our book covers it, because I understand that my colleague Masha Kirasirova is slated to talk next month and will surely pick up, will tell you what comes next and pick up on some of the themes that I've kind of laid down here. Um, but the two points are that, that um, people were the Russia's main strategic resource in the Ottoman Arab lands. So migrating peoples, expelled peoples, they provided Russia with excuses for showing up in and establishing a physical presence in places of interest to Russia. Um, that's one and, and two, and this is really the final point. Um, the czarist and Soviet stories of connection to the Arab world and the Middle East are not separate. One leads to the next. And Soviet power in and relations with the Middle East um, this were built largely on the institutional infrastructure and human legacies of consulates and schools that the Tsar's government built across the Ottoman Arab world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Eileen. It was fascinating and uh, couldn't agree more on the connections between the two periods. And we would have them all in one meeting if we had enough time, but we have to split it into two. So now uh, I'd like to turn it over to Vladimir. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it, it is a pleasure to be here to be part of this amazing historical series on Russia's worlds. And huge thanks to Sam, to Azad, to Carly Jackson for coordinating this. Um, Herman is one of my favorite places in the world. So it's really great to be back, even if uh, virtually. And I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be doing this with um, Eileen Kane. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I will talk about my book project and then segue into my broader takes on how migration connects the um, connects Ottoman and Russian imperial histories. My book project is titled Empire of Refugees, uh, North Caucasian Muslims and the Late Ottoman State. And the book examines uh, the migration of Muslims from the North Caucasus region and their resettlement in the Ottoman domains between 1860 and World War I. And in that period, about 1 million um, Muslims from the Caucasus moved to the Middle East. They joined several million other Muslim refugees um, who were also seeking refuge in Ottoman Anatolia and Syria, primarily Muslims from the Balkans, uh, Crimea, and Crete. In a broad sense, the fundamental premise of my work is that migration and forced displacements were central to creating the modern Middle East. And I'm particularly interested in um, the political economy of refugee resettlement and the impact that Muslim resettlement had on the social and economic climate in the final decades of the Ottoman Empire. So now I will share my screen with you. So which refugees am I um, talking about? In the 19th century, the North Caucasus had a majority Sunni Muslim population and the mountainous communities there spoke uh, dozens of uh, different languages and had a history of political autonomy from the outside empires. Refugees to the Ottoman Empire would come from the following communities, most refugees. Uh, that would be Circassians who were divided into about a dozen different subgroups. Western Circassians lived on the coast of the Black Sea and the slopes of the Western Caucasus Mountains. And the Eastern Circassians would be further in the North Central Caucasus. They include the Kabardians. Abkhazians would live sort of to the south of the Circassian coast um, in one of the two gateways from Russia into Georgia uh, and Chechens on the high plateaus in the Northeast. But there were many others who would also be emigrating 
um, including Abazians, Assetians, Karachais, Balkars, Ingush, um, Kumex, Dargians, Avars, and Nogai Tatars. And this region was fully incorporated into Russia in, well, in the 1860s. Um, by 1864, uh, there was, um, in, the, in the final stages of the Caucasus War, uh, there was an ethnic cleansing of Circassians, and about at least half a million refugees were expelled uh, from the Circassian coast, and they fled by boats to the Ottoman Balkans and um, Anatolia. It was the largest refugee crisis in Ottoman history at that point. It was also one of the largest uh, globally at the time. Uh, this uh, ethnic cleansing and expulsions is uh, a contested political issue today. Um, the Russian government denies it in, in those terms. And while the large Circassian diaspora uh, in the Middle East and in the United States um, has been calling to recognize the expulsions as a genocide. Uh, and the reasons for this uh, ethnic cleansing, um, you know, comes from the government's, Russian government's plans to colonize the fertile Kuban region with Slavic and Christian settlers uh, and to expel the populations it did not consider, it, it considered suspect. So the vast majority of Circassians were expelled in, in what was clearly, um, you know, a case of, you know, brutal forced migration. And their arrival prompted the Ottomans to build a massive infrastructure for refugee resettlement, one that the Ottomans would be perfecting over the next half century. Maybe perfecting is a bit generous, but so, but after 1864, when the Caucasus was already within Russia, the emigration, Muslim emigration from the region continued. And this emigration is incredibly comprehensive. It um, extended to virtually every ethnic group and cut across socioeconomic lines. And of course, this migration coincides with the migration, the Jewish migration, right, from the Pale of Settlement to the Ottoman Empire and also to the Americas. So after 1864, um, various groups were emigrating for different reasons, but mostly they perceived Russian rule as illegitimate and an assault on, on their freedoms and also expected that the life in the Ottoman Empire would be, would be better. Much of the migration stemmed from the confiscation of land through the Russian land reforms, which was sort of the extension of the, um, of the Russian peasant reform. The fear that anti-Muslim discrimination would continue drove further immigration um, and North Caucasians often cited their fear of conscription, um, forcible conversion to Christianity and introduction of additional taxes. Um, and also slavery. Slavery was um, a big part of this displacement because many slave owning families took their slaves by force to the Ottoman Empire where slave ownership remained legal un until the very end. It is one of those cases where slavery and refugee migration coalesce. So I guess kind of a unique case in some ways in global history. It also created all kinds of legal and ideological problems um, for the Ottoman government because the slaves state slaves when they arrived in the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, they were also refugees and they became Ottoman subjects who you know, were eligible for certain rights that came with it. And that tension was never really resolved. Here's another map. By the early 20th century, North Caucasians lived in virtually every Ottoman province. Uh, they were resettled almost exclusively in the countryside, um, almost never in the cities. And this map is based on my compiled digital um, database of uh, North Caucasian refugee villages. Most of those villages were new. They were built um, in the 50 years before uh, World War I, and they're also color-coded um, for different ethnic groups, as reflected in the legend. Before the 1877-1878 Russo-Ottoman War, about half of all the Circassians were resettled in the Ottoman Balkans, in what is now um, Northern Greece, Macedonia, uh, Bulgaria, and Romania. But after the war, they were expelled and they left for Anatolian Syria. So, and Snow Balkans on the map. Um, the, the archives that I'm working with for this um, very transnational project are located in both the former Russian um, 
imperial and the Ottoman worlds, right? So I found amazing data on emigration um, in archives in Moscow, Tbilisi, Vladikavkaz, Nanchik, and Mahachkala. And then my main research sites for data on refugee resettlement is in Istanbul, um, Sofia, and Amman. And as I mentioned, I'm interested in the political economy of this resettlement. The outcomes of the resettlement were very different depending on where we looked. So what was constant throughout the empire was the conflict over land. Land was not free and it was not free of people because it never is. So this map shows, um, the dashes on this map show regions with most conflict and that conflict was primarily over the land. Uh, the Ottoman government gave the refugees land that was typically claimed by someone else um, or appropriated from someone. Or sometimes refugees took the land that they expected to be allotted to them. And of course, it led to all kinds of um, fines, uh, fights throughout the late Ottoman period. So North Caucasians were fighting with, um, with Ottoman Greeks in, um, in Turks in Western Anatolia, with Armenians and Kurds in Central and Eastern Anatolia, and then Druze and Arab Bedouin in Syria. And those conflicts between refugees and local populations did not exist in a, in a vacuum. They were part of the increasingly volatile political climate of the late Ottoman Empire. And I would even claim that the survival of Ottoman rule in many of its regions, um, especially on the kind of imperial periphery, depended on how well refugee resettlement was going there. Clashes between Muslim refugees who were placed there, who were settled there by the government, and others, especially Ottoman Christians, were short fused to a full-blown sectarian conflict. And that is a critical missing piece in the story of the unraveling in the Ottoman Balkans and the expulsion, eventual expulsion of the Ottoman Empire from half of its Balkan territories. Uh, and this is something that my book examines in, in detail. But it is also an important context for the unraveling of Eastern Anatolia and the Armenian provinces of the Ottoman Empire and um, leading all the way to the Armenian genocide. And the connection between the resettlement of Muslim refugees, maybe not North Caucasians, right, but the refugees from the at that point, and the connection with the Ottoman cleansing of, um, of Christians in the 1900s and 1910s is, is there and um, requires serious investigation. One region that I want to zoom in on, uh, just because the, the resettlement story is so striking there, is um, Jordan, speaking of Russia's connections with the Arab world. So the southernmost refugee villages in, um, in the empire were in um, Jordan. And the first Circassians arrived there in 1878. By World War I, there were eight Circassian and Chechen villages. Notably, three out of the four largest cities in Jordan today were founded by these Muslim refugees from Russia. The capital of Jordan, Amman, now has 4 million people. But during World War I, it was a Circassian refugee village with a population of 5,000 people. So how did this Arab newcomers play such an important role in building up the political and economic center of what is today an, um, you know, an Arab nation state? By examining um, local records, court records and land records, and by some miracle, I got access. I got the Jordanian security clearance to um, to have access to all the uh, late Ottoman land registers, which are usually under lock and key. So thanks to that, I found that in this region, um, refugees received very generous, well, generous um, allotments of free land, but more importantly, their right to that land was backed by the Ottoman government through both a new police force and, um, and the courts. And refugees actively used the new also new Ottoman land laws to properly register and buy as much additional land as, as they could. Uh, by doing that, by registering the land through the, through the new laws, they prompted others, including Bedouin, uh, who never did this before, to 
do the same in order not to lose their claims to the land. So there's kind of a, an avalanche of registration of land and then reselling the land to each other. And refugees are emerging as sort of real estate entrepreneurs in the, in the early 20th century. Throughout the Ottoman Empire, they've been um, entrenching the new Ottoman land regime that is characterized by land appropriation by the government, but then also centralized taxation. And with it came a new form of capital accumulation in the Ottoman state. Refugees also benefited from the Hijaz railway. So infrastructure helps and it went through Oman. Um, so it, it was um, the only railway built on the Ottoman money connecting Damascus and Medina for pilgrimage. And it went through the refugee village of Oman. Uh, which increased external interest in the region. And so others arrived in this booming settlement, including um, Syrian Palestinian merchants, bringing their capital with them, further investing in real estate, further investing in um, agricultural estates. And that's kind of the story of uh, refugee real estate entrepreneurship is the origin story of what today is the largest city in, in the Levant. So refugees in this case, Muslim refugees from Russia, were not just imperial pawns who, you know, lack agency as they're often portrayed in literature, but they were drivers of economic expansion um, in the Ottoman Middle East. And in the Levant, at least, the settlement of these refugees helped strengthen Ottoman rule and tied the nomadic frontier closer um, to the Ottoman state. So it's it, it really bolstered the Ottoman authority here. Um, I will end um, with three broad implications of, of this research and um, kind of contributions to broader Middle Eastern, transnational Russian and global history and uh, international migration history. So first, this North Caucasian resettlement challenges many Western-centric assumptions about, about migration and terminology of migration. And I'm using the term refugees throughout to underscore the forced nature of expulsion of uh, most of these people, especially um, Western Circassians in the 1860s, and also the inability of all refugees to return to Russia, uh, at least in theory, because Russia instituted a, migration, a return migration ban a Muslim ban, right, on return migration of North Caucasians. And the term that Muslim refugees used to describe themselves was, at the time, was muhajir, that comes from Arabic. Originally, it denotes someone emigrating from a non-Muslim territory to a Muslim territory in order to preserve their faith. But by the 19th century, as the Ottoman world is shrinking because of constant European imperial conquest and the national movements in the Balkans, the term Muhajir becomes, it acquires anti-colonial and anti-imperialist sentiments, right? And this term is not easily translatable, but it's absolutely central to understanding these migrations. Um, it has a rich legacy within Islamic history of thinking about migration and why people move. And it kind of, um, challenges this whole voluntary forced migration spectrum that scholars of Western migration often operate with. Um, it also evokes a relationship between one's faith and territorial belonging, which is, again, very different from understanding migration in secular terms. And second, um, my book argues that the Ottomans created a refugee regime. And refugee regimes are typically seen as a 20th century phenomena, phenomenon um, of the contemporary nation state system. The notion of refugee as a legal identity goes back to World War I, right? And here's another very prominent connection between uh, the Middle East and, and Russia. It, it goes back to the international relief for Russian refugees and then Armenian refugees in the aftermath of the war. The modern refugee regime was set up after World War II by the United Nations. And the contemporary refugee regime is based on this idea that refugees are those whom their nation states are unable or unwilling to protect. It's all about citizenship in a nation state, right? 
the Ottomans built their regime around this notion of Muhajir, right? So it had a completely different genealogy. And uh, Muhajir had nothing to do with citizenship, at least until the 1910s. And this identity was based on one's belonging to a religious community and the Ottoman sultanates, Ottoman, Ottoman caliphates, responsibility to protect fellow Muslims. There were rights of refugees and there were responsibilities of the state within that regime. So I see the Ottomans building uh, their own refugee regime way before the kind of contemporary international regime was set up. And importantly, this refugee regime was set up by the Ottomans specifically in response to refugee migrations from Russia. First, the Crimean Tatars after the Crimean War, which ended in 1856, and then in response to the Circassian refugee crisis in, um, in the early 1860s. And so finally, um, the last point, it is about pushing the timeline of demographic engineering in both regions for the back. In his geography, forced migrations and ethnic cleansings in the 1910s, sorry, in the 1910s and 1920s are credited with the quote unquote unmixing of populations, which created the modern map of the Middle East and the Balkans and the Caucasus. And particularly it's the literature on, um, on the Armenian genocide and the 1923 Greek-Turkish population exchange. But I think the roots of demographic engineering should be sought earlier in the 19th century. And the migration of Muslims from Russia to the Ottoman Empire, which was largely welcomed by both states, set a precedent. It confirmed this very dangerous idea that a massive population can be pushed out and resettled elsewhere for the benefit of the state on a whim of the state. And this idea fit many ideologies and was implemented in both regions again and again, right? From genocides in Anatolia in the 1910s to Stalin's ethnic cleansings in the Caucasus and Crimea in the 1940s. So that's, that's the ideological impact of this. But then there was also the institutional impact. The Ottoman refugee resettlement infrastructure, which was massive, was inherited right after the after World War One by Turkey, by Syria, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, uh, Greece, right through the acquisition of, of Greek Macedonia and other nation states. And they inherited not just the physical infrastructure, but also the legislation and the know-how of, of moving people around. So overall, 19th century migrations from Russia to the Middle East uh, had a massive impact on on national histories within those regions, um, you know, the making of those nations uh, in, in the 20th century. Um, I'll stop here. Thank you. And I, I, I very much look forward to our discussion. Yes, yeah, so why don't we, we go into that and, and uh, have you and Eileen sort of speak a bit to each other and maybe ask each other some questions that might have come up in these presentations or based on, on your on your readings of each other's work um, and kind of have a discussion over maybe some larger implications uh, or more details that we didn't get to uh, in these two uh, subjects. Okay, I've unmute. can I start? I have, so I just, your book is so awesome. Um, that was such a wonderful presentation. I'm so excited to see. You also have an article out um, I did want to plug that that just came out um, on Armenian conversion conversions to the Armenian Muslims converting to the Armenian faith in the Caucasus. And I noted that you also brought up, um, I haven't read the whole thing yet. I just was able to read the abstract before, but you, you also bring up, I mean, you're sort of bringing things together that aren't usually brought together. This is kind of what I was getting at in this book that you're a part of when I said that this the anthology is trying, we have these sort of parallel stories that should be intersecting, but are not. And I see you bringing these together in, in your own work. You bring up Jews and the Pale, um, Jews from the Pale of Settlement converting to Ar the Armenian faith. Is that right in your article? Yeah, also, actually Jews all over the empire, both in the Pale, in the Caucasus, and even in Central Asia. Which to me is just, um, I mean, it just is bringing things together in this, in this article, just it's just so wonderful because um, you know the study of Jews in the Russian Empire is usually it's it's really um, 
uh, the pale of settlement. And then if you want to get at um, sort of connections or conversions or, or even coexistence with Muslims, people say, well, the, you know, we can look at Bukhara or at the Caucasus. Um, forgetting that people are also moving around in these periods, even from the pale, they're not necessarily staying where they are. So you're bringing all these things together in this amazing way. I wanted to ask about, um, you're telling a story in this book about the Ottomans seeing these migrants as useful. And as it sounds like in Jordan, they were sort of um, working to establish Ottoman authority in these places. They're trusting them to kind of, here's where I'm getting, here's where I'm going. Sabine Dittingill has written about, um, uh, and there's someone else I feel like who's also written about this, but there's this idea out there that I think I see you um, eating away at here, or maybe taking down that these people were seen as suspect. So Muslim migrants to, um, there was fear, he has this article I can't remember the name of right now, but that there was a fear that these Muslim migrants from the Russian Empire might actually be agents of um, Russia and they weren't in, altogether, um, they weren't to be trusted. You know the article I'm thinking, I mean, I think it, it may also be in his book um, that it's you know, been out for a while now, um, but we still read and talk about the well-protected domains. Um, so do you grapple with this at all in the book? Because I think others who know his article know his work, th th this idea is out there. And is that something you're taking on head on in your work? It, I mean, it sounds like they, they trust these people. They don't see them as, um, you know, there's an issue that also came up with buying property in, um, in the Hejaz and you have Indian Muslims and then you have Russian Muslims and they don't want this to happen because they're afraid that then this land is gonna to belong to Russia and then they've sort of colonized this area. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for amazing questions. Um, I think I'm more pushing against uh, historiography that there's this assumption that those refugees, they come into the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman government immediately uses them, right, for like all kinds of nefarious purposes. And it uses them more well, for sectarian purposes to change the uh, demographic ratios on the margins. And that literature comes especially like when you look at the, at, at the Balkans and it all comes out of the national and nationalist narratives. And I think we need to chronologically, yes, but not immediately. So when people are coming in the 1860s, right, it's the height of the refugee crisis. The country accepts at least half a million people within a matter of years, right? People are dying in the ports. It's a horrendous situation. And my sense is that there's less of a strategy from the Ottoman government. It's more of a mess. And they're just trying to settle them wherever, wherever there's free land. So uh, most migrants would actually end up at that time in the Muslim majority regions. But then there's the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877-78. And I, you know, I don't, it's not necessarily a rupture, right? Like as it is often portrayed in, in late Ottoman history, but it was critically important in how the Ottomans sort of started thinking about the empire and how uh, so many policies became more defensive. And so after 1878, it's much more strategic use of, of refugees, especially those coming from the Balkans. So they are being used to change the demographic ratios. On the end, they are being sent to areas with many Kurds and with many Arab Bedouin just to extend the state's control. Yeah, and uh, thank, thank you for mentioning the article. I, um, so the article came out in Comparative Studies in Society and History, and it's about the conversions of Muslims, Assyrians, Yazidis, and Jews in the South Caucasus into the Armenian faith. And I was, uh, I was collecting those materials for years as I was going to the archives in the Caucasus uh, because the story is so incredible and it just didn't make sense to me at first. And so I, um, I was set to investigate why, why people were converting um, what were the social classes and where those people lived. Uh, it's not a mass phenomenon, of course, but nevertheless, it is a phenomenon that is persistent throughout late imperial Russian rule. Uh, it's primarily people who were um, uh, shepherds or you know, sharecroppers living in this like rim, southern rim, um, the, the lesser Caucasus mountains, right on the border of um, Russian border of the Ottoman and Iranian empires. Uh, and there were quite a bit, um, quite a few conversions there. And of course, what is striking is that that all is happening as there's a mass phenomenon of forced conversions of Armenians um, into Islam and well, parts of Eastern Anatolia are on their way to the genocide. 
Eileen, I also have a question. I'm, <laughs> I'm very curious about your current project and I am wondering, uh, so I was speaking about Muslim migrations and Jewish migrations, right? From, from Russia to the Ottoman Empire. Do you see institutional connections there, right? Either in terms of the push from the Russian Empire or as those migrants uh, and refugees are coming into the Ottoman Empire, are there, what is intellectual, is there shared intellectual framework for immigration? Is there are any connections between the leaders of that immigration, between Jewish and Muslim intellectuals in the Russian Empire? Um, so I guess, um, One of the things that I'm interested in, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, say that I think one of the things you've done, which is something that I'm, I should start by saying, I went to a talk, um, I was on leave one year at Brown and studying um, modern Middle East history and David Myers came and gave a talk and said this really provocative thing that um, if he gave a talk on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and he said, if you wanna understand the roots of this conflict, you really should uh, go to Russia to the 1880s. And so when you know, sort of making this argument that if Russia hadn't kind of forced people, encouraged people, you know, by the end, they're actually setting up institutions in Russia through, I think it's called the JCA, um, to help people leave, um, that we never would have gotten to this point. So it was a sort of provocative point, but I was happy to hear it because um, I feel like Russia, you, you hear about the British when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian mm -hmm. conflict and the history of everything that came beforehand, but Russia kind of drops out of the picture. And I've always kind of wondered um, why that is. Um, I, I mean, I guess the, the short answer is, I, I don't know yet the answer to these questions. I'm interested to find out. I'm, um, the thing I wanted to say is, I'm, you know, I often teach Maris's book, um, The Unwanted, about refugees. And I feel like you've done one of my big critiques or, or you know, a critique of the book is that this earlier um, expulsion or ethnic cleansing, I, you've very nicely also educated me about there's there's a lot of difference it's not just like one massive ethnic cleansing you have to sort of break this thing down in terms of who actually left on their own who decided to leave who was actually expelled there are stages to this um history that you know others have written about also but you're you know you did a very nice job of of um you know there, there is a difference between a migrant and a refugee between someone who's expelled and someone who decides to leave but this is left out of so when we talk about ethnic cleansing in europe this is never mentioned so i'm hoping that your work will help um sort of bring these things together um i guess um at this point i'm and i'm still reading and thinking and um you know I don't usually like to give caveats, but I do, there are probably people here in the same boat. So I have children at home. And so I have gotten a lot less done on this, this book um, than that I'd hoped this year. So I say that only because I don't want to make it seem like I'm writing two books and everything's going swimmingly because things are really hard right now um, in terms of, and I was supposed to of course do research trips this year. So um, some of these questions are, are ones that I hope to um, answer more, but I am interested and I think um, I think of Elena Campbell's, um, Campbell's book as she's one of the scholars who I think does a good job of showing us that in the minds of Russian officials, they thought of these two things as connected, um, um, Russian and, and Muslim populations as being problematic in the same way as being also potentially useful when they're abroad, um, but also um, not necessarily kind of problem populations. So um, I want to sort of go back to her work and, and her sources to um, develop that a little more. And I, you know, I guess one thing I wanted to you know, I sort of started off talking about there being a Russian side to thinking about Russia and the Ottoman Empire and there being a um, Ottoman or Middle East side. And I sort of think of you as this sort of like strange, wonderful creature who kind of was trained by both and kind of does both. But I, but, um, I think in the end, the book I'm trying to write um, is, is really gonna be about Russia. Um, and I'm wondering if that, um, 
sort of how Russia thought and felt about these populations, what role the state played in, in you know, did it want them to leave or did it not want them to leave? Did it encourage and why did it, did it regret sending people abroad? And I'm very interested also in this question, once they are abroad, well, let's not necessarily lose, lose touch with them because they're still, not because not we want them to come back, but um, they still are kind of ours and they're useful to us in, in other ways. You know, I'm thinking of Mark Choate's work on emigrant colonialism, which Tara Zara talks about also, that even though these populations are somewhere else in the world, it's useful to us to hold, uh, sort of maintain ties with them. So, but one of the things I've been thinking about when I do have time to work on this, this monograph this year is, is this a book about Russia or is it about the Middle East? And I'm, I, um, and, Maybe you could do both, but I think ultimately it, you have to, it's sort of grounded in one place. So um, I guess I wanted to toss that question back to you. Do you, um, and I see you're also in a global studies department now, I think, which seems to be a good fit for someone who does both, but do you identify as more one than the other? Do you agree with my opening statement that the interest in this seems to be coming more from the Russian side? Because that doesn't describe you. Yeah, I was thinking about that opening statement. Um, I think it is a tension, right, for everyone who is doing some kind of Russian Ottoman history. Like, is it going to be about Russia or is it going to be about the Ottoman Empire or the Middle East? And, um, and everyone resolves it in a different way. In my case, this book will be... It will be both. It will be a transnational history because... Uh, Part of, my, part of the story that I didn't talk about today is about the making of the, of the diaspora, right? The making of the North Caucasian diaspora in the Ottoman Empire and how many of those ideas travel back to, you know, to the Caucasus and many people travel back. There was return migration. I mentioned that on paper, uh, there was a ban on return migration and it remained throughout the late Imperial Russian rule. Um, which was fascinating. It was a ban to the point that Ottoman subjects could get visas to travel to the Russian Caucasus, right? Essentially as tourists. But if you were an Ottoman subject of North Caucasian descent, the Russian consulates were likely to, to reject your application to travel. So it was a ban. Nevertheless, people were trying to get back home. And um, Sort of, I found this in, in the archives in the North Caucasus, sort of many petitions of people trying to return, and also many unauthorized crossings of the Russo Ottoman border, and many people succeeded in returning. And it was a matter, there was the ideological component of what the Russian government wanted. It didn't want them back, right? It was pretty explicit. Then there was also the financial and logistical component of this all. We don't want you back, but if you make it back, it is so much more, it is so expensive to send you back and deport you that we'll just quietly resettle you, right? And so uh, tens of thousands of Abkhazians and Chechens uh, managed to return and were resettled. So they were Russian subjects, then Ottoman subjects, then Russian subjects again. And this is in this um, is before World War One. Yes, yes. This all is before World War One. Okay, so this is also uh, and James, World War I, James Meyer has that provocative, cool article that everyone talks about. That so you're sort of expanding on that and picking up. Right. Yes. His uh, his article wonderful uh, deals mostly with Crimean Tatars, and this is more about the the Abkhazians and the Chechens who managed to come back. And I, I also I I do want to mention that. There are so many wonderful historians and other scholars who are working on, on Russian Ottoman migration. There have been so many incredible works in the last, uh, I don't know, five years. Uh, of course, your book that is absolutely wonderful about the pilgrimage, uh, the Hajj. Uh, then we have Lali Jan, who just published a book with Stanford University Press, Spiritual Subjects, Central Asian Pilgrims, and the Ottoman Hajj at the End of the Empire. And that book also sort of fascinating classification in terms of how migrants from the Russian Empire and from the Central Asian protectorates were classified in the Ottoman Empire. Some of them were pilgrims, some of them came to the Hijaz and stayed, right? Like for, for years on end, they were Mujahideen. Um, then we have Will Smiley, um, who has uh, wonderful books on From Slaves to Prisoners of War uh, that deals with international law and the impact of 
migrations between the two empires. It's all international law. Um, James H. Meyer talks across empires. And I've seen this morning that there's a, that there's a Turkish translation of this book, really. So that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, and Andrew Roberts, um, who worked on the Balkans, migration and disease in the Black Sea region, on Russian relations in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And um, there we see a different kind of migration, the labor migrants, right? Usually Slavic labor migrants crossing the Danube, right? From Russia to the Ottoman Empire and vice versa, uh, starting in the late 18th century. Um, yeah, maybe I, maybe I missed someone and I apologize for that. So I just want to come in and maybe start to ask some of the questions that are in the chat because we've got a, a number of really good questions. I think I'll start with a, a question from uh, Said Gaziev and I'll just paraphrase it. But the question is about what kinds of agreements are made between the Russian and Ottoman empires over the expulsion of the Circassians and what the form of those agreements looks like and whether uh, either empire is sort of held to account uh, for meeting those agreements or for meeting obligations or violating obligations that are, that are, uh, they might have agreed to for towards the refugees in those agreements. So what's the form of the agreement and then how are they held up? Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. uh, for this question. There, yes, there were uh, two uh, that I can, that I, we know all for sure. The first one, so the two bilateral agreements between the Russians and the Ottomans. Uh, the first one was in 1860 and uh, Mikhail Loris Melikov, um, a Russian general who would later become a governor of Tzerek province in the Caucasus. He traveled to Istanbul right. to negotiate the Ottoman resettlement of Circassians. And uh, the Ottomans agreed to resettle between 40,000 to 50,000 um, of Circassians over a period of several years. Uh, so obviously that number was greatly exceeded by 1864, um, but the, so I'm not sure what, what, that, what that agreement means and the fact that it was exceeded. I don't think the Ottomans or the Russians cared very much about it. The second uh, bilateral agreement was uh, followed more closely. It was in 1865. Um, and my contribution to the beautiful source book that is coming out soon, uh, it, it, it is about the migration of Chechens from Tzedek region to Anatolia and Syria in 1865. 1864, there was the Kunta Haji uprising in Chechnya and following that uprising, the Russians and the Ottomans negotiated um, the population transfer specific to the Tzedek region mostly Chechens, but there were some Cardians, Ossetians, and Ingush who took part as well. Um, I'm not sure if the number was specified in that agreement, but uh, it, was, it was quite literally organized by both empires. It wasn't the forced expulsions, right, as it happened to the Circassians um, early in the decade. There were 28 processions uh, from throughout Chechnya to Vladikavkaz, and then all the way to Batum, and then um, those 28 processions were received by the Ottoman Refugee Commission, a resettlement agency that was resettling migrants in the Ottoman Empire. So, um, and then following that agreement and following that resettlement, both countries, both governments awarded the officials responsible for the resettlement medals. So we see, so in the archives, in both Ottoman and Russian archives, we see evidence of like job well done, population transfer accomplished. So these are two that I know of, uh, but I don't think there's more than that. Great. So I want to take a question from Peter Holquist uh, for Eileen. Uh, Peter writes, um, wonderful presentation. You spoke about Russia and the Ottoman world and Russia and the Arab world. Uh, can you speak to how the Persianate world fits into this story? You're muted, Ali. You're on, you're on mute. Thank so you, yeah. thank you. Um, it doesn't, and it does. So great question. I guess we had a long discussion about this, Masha and Margaret and I in the beginning, um, and felt that, okay, Turkey, the Ottoman, um, mostly Anatolia, as I mentioned, the Balkans, Turkey, Persia, we have scholarship on this, um, but uh, 
that is connected to Russia, but we really don't have much on the Arab world. So we decided early on to make it just about the Arab world. I would say that um, uh, sort of wonderfully, um, Zainab um, Azhar Badigan, who is a graduate student at Columbia, um, she is, we are finalizing her um, contribution, her essay right now. So Persia has kind of come into the picture because she has this amazing essay um, based on documents that she found. It, it turns out you can't really leave Persia out of the story completely. Um, so thank you for this question, Peter, because um, it is kind of artificial to kind of lop Persia off and leave it out. So she discovered in the um, Iranian Foreign Ministry archives a document about uh, Russian you know, Shiites in Karbala appealing to the Persian government because they said, what the heck happened? We have these Vakuf lands in Yerevan um, that were bequeathed to uh, support the major shrine in Karbala, the major Shi shrine in Karbala, and the money has stopped coming. And you need to help us um, get that. So Russia takes over, the South Caucasus takes over Yerevan and the revenue stopped flowing. So, um, you know, she has a very good definition of what a Vakuf is. For those who don't know, it's a religious endowment and it's supposed to go on forever. So like endowments are supposed to, I guess, like, so the money is, is um, the revenues generated from this farm are supposed to keep going to help support the shrine. And so this is a violation of, um, you know, they make all kinds of arguments about what it's, what it's violating and why it shouldn't be happening. But it's also, we decided to title her, um, her contribution, Eurasian Worlds Interrupted, um, to make use of this term Eurasia, but it's here you have this these Shi'i networks and this um, these religious worlds that have been kind of interrupted by the Russian conquest. And I've looked and I haven't found yet anyone who, there is some work, um, Vladimir, maybe you know, um, of sources that um, we could include that I haven't found, but there doesn't seem to be much work on Shi'i Vakus. There seems to be some work in more on Central Asia, uh, maybe, maybe Crimea, but this question of, um, and they're very important to the functioning of religious life and the maintenance of this, in particular, this major shrine in Karbala. Um, so this is a long way of saying we did sort of sneak Persia in at the end. We felt like we wanted to remove it um, because just to keep this sharp focus on the Arab world, which really has not gotten a lot of attention, as I said at the start, but um, it turns out you can't really remove it entirely because, um, you know, and the hope is of course, as with the source book, that this will then provoke others to kind of think more about um, Wakufs, for example, and to think about what the, the um, consequences were for just, you know, and also to what extent Russia even knew that they didn't just conquer lands and peoples, but they, um, and, and it's interesting because establishing consulates abroad is, as I said, is often how they start to understand what they have in the caucuses and what's going on there. Um, so I don't know, Vladimir, do you have comments on this? I just want to quickly add that I think there's so much work uh, to be done on migrations between the Russian Empire and Qajars. Uh, for example, the Shia pilgrimage, I mean, it, it sounds incredible. And there's so many people from the East Caucasus and from Central Asia who were going to Mecca on, on their way. They were visiting all those Shia shrines. So that's an incredible topic. And then the so I've seen a lot of documents in um, AFPRI, in the archive of the foreign, Russian Foreign Ministry, uh, on the migrations of the nomadic uh, communities, actually between all three, between Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and the Iranian Empire. And it sounds like all three governments did not quite control it, did not know what to do with it, certainly wanted to suppress it and prevent it. So that's a great dissertation topic idea. But yeah, more work needs to be done. Oh, I should, if I could add also, she, uh, Zainab has a second document about the corpse traffic. So this was a whole thing too, that, you know, you store the corpses for a while, the she corpse traffic to, to have the, the corpses uh, buried in, in these cemetery, this massive cemetery in Karbala. And then this becomes a public health issue. Um, but again, involving the Iranians and the Ottomans and the, because you have to cross an Ottoman border, I think, to get there. Um, so great dissertation topic, it seems to me. Um, so she's sort of introducing it to us and offering it up to us. Um, but yeah, the corpse traffic is another one. And, and of course, the Hajj has kind of hogged all the attention of those of us interested in pilgrimage, but the Shi'i pilgrimage really needs um, to be studied. 
I, I just want to add a, a couple things here in that uh, a, a student in our department, uh, Shahini Chodapai, is working on the corpse traffic um, sort of in India and the Ottoman Empire and the uh, invo British involvement in that as well. And I think that's a fascinating topic. And then on Persia, I mean, Eileen, you talked about the importance of consulates uh, and the establishment of consulates for uh, protecting Russian interests and people and also for sort of generating knowledge. And that's hugely important in a period that I know a little bit more about closer to the beginning of the First World War in Northern Iran, where the, the Russian consular presence is enormous and, you know, is directed at, in some cases, protecting uh, Russian settlers who are moving into Northern Iran. And it's, it becomes a very um, live geopolitical issue with the British too. So the, yeah. the, the consular uh, angle is really important there too, I think. Uh, I wanted to take, I think I'm going to take three questions here um, that are sort of meant for Vladimir, but I think that you both have things to say about them. Uh, one is also from Peter Holquist. I'll just paraphrase sort of uh, the term ethnic cleansing and the term demographic engineering. Uh, you mentioned that that this period is is a different period from uh, in a different context from that of the nation state when we're used to thinking about these, uh, when we often hear about these kinds of processes. So does ethnic cleansing fit this process given um, that it is taking place in an imperial context that is not geared towards the kind of homogeneity that the nation state uh, initiatives of ethnic cleansing might be. Another question from uh, Alexander Polyanichev, which I think is related. Uh, he asks, to what extent the Circassian settlement in the Ottoman Empire can be framed as a settler colonial experience uh, rather than or alongside or along, along with uh, a refugee experience? Um, and uh, then there was a, uh, yeah, so let's just take those two for now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take the second question first. So settler colonialism, yes, absolutely. Like it was a settler colonial experiment from the perspective of people whose land was take, taken from them, right? But I mean, that's the issue. It kind of complicates how we understand settler colonialism that uh, refugees, you know, can also be settlers from the perspectives of those, you know, um, who become their neighbors. I think what complicates this even further is when we consider the issue of slaves, slaves who had no agency, no choice in being expelled from Circassia and who remained slaves to their masters. Both of them, you know, both of those groups were Muhajirs within the Ottoman Empire, but at the same time, were those slaves also settlers from the perspective of those, you know, whose land was taken? It's, um, it's, it's complicated and it's, it's, it's messy. Um, and then demographic engineering. Um, yeah, I'm, I, so I'm, I'm using the term for, for the late 19th and early 20th century. And I think the Ottoman Empire, you know, in, in the Hamidian regime and under the rule of the Young Turks is essentially transitioning to, from an empire to a nation state. So it, it, it becomes already applicable. And, um, in terms of demographic engineering, like from 1878 onwards, uh, the Ottomans are quite specific in their reports, well, secret reports, that they want to change the ratios of populations, right? That there need to be either a certain ratio or they want to achieve um, Muslim plural plurality or Muslim majority on the borders with Bulgaria, with Greece, etc. The issue of ethnic cleansing, um, even though ethnicity does not necessarily come into that so early on, once religious faith comes in and, you know, there's a bigger debate in Ottoman history, right? Late Ottoman history, how ethnicity and religion kind of come together. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's already after 1878, it's difficult to disentangle them. So yeah, I think I would make a case for, you know, ethnic cleansing being a proper, an appropriate term. But I look forward to speaking with um, Peter Holquist more about this. I think that would be really productive. I'm going to take one more question uh, from David Shrey about the question is, how do these Ottoman Russian migration themes intersect with the incursion of 
the German Empire into the and German interests into the Ottoman Empire uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and how do they relate to the so what we often refer to as the great game between the um, uh, for between the Russians and the British. Eileen, do you have anything to say about this? It's <laughs> a big question. Uh, I'll be honest. I do not see much of German connection there for this specific topic. Um, and the British, you know, I see the British meddling um, as much as, you know, Russian and French meddling, from, med using the, the word meddling from the Ottoman perspective, of course, uh, in terms that the Ottomans could not fully exercise their control of their settlement, right, as their sovereignty was being eroded, they could not settle. Um, I mean, that, that, that's kind of the, the irony. After 1878, they wanted to exercise control of their settlement and settle Muhajirs where they needed to go. But then they also could not settle them in all those places they wanted to settle them in because the British and the French and the Russians uh, did not want them anywhere near uh, Palestine, essentially. It was difficult to settle them in Lebanon as well because of all the European interests in the region. And um, if, you, if you remember the map that I showed of the North Caucasian settlements, uh, there were very few in Eastern Anatolia because uh, Russia made it very clear that they should not be settled near the Russian borders because Russia was afraid that they would be used, that they would be drawn into the Ottoman military, you know, and, or maybe even more importantly, that they would try to return to Russia, you know, if they're settled too closely. So uh, kind of that's how I see the European powers coming in mostly mm -hmm. in this issue. Yeah. Okay, Eileen, do you have thoughts on that or? Um, okay, so I think we're just about out of time, but uh, Azat has returned and he wanted to ask a question. So I'm gonna uh, give uh, him the last question. Thank you very much, Eileen and Vladimir for a great presentation. So, although I'm sure they were great, but I missed uh, the largest part of them. Um, so my question goes to Vladimir. So uh, one of the, uh, many great things I found in your dissertation is your analysis of slavery in connection to the Ottoman abolitionism and nationality law. Uh, so you clearly show how uh, Circassian refugee slave owners um, sought to mobilize the Ottoman state apparatus to uphold and perpetuate uh, uh, sort of uh, the uh, slave owning order that they brought uh, from the old country, right? And um, so to say, and at the same time, the slaves themselves were claiming and appealing to the new Ottoman legal frameworks to support their claim uh, for uh, manumission. Um, so my question is about gender, how um, women slavery uh, fits into this story? Uh, have you found anything interesting in the sources about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tazat, and welcome back. Uh, so uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, there is incredible work done on uh, late Ottoman uh, slavery. So Ehud Talidano uh, and also Jada Karamursel is currently writing a book that will kind of like change how we think about late Ottoman slavery. Um, Yes, slavery was a big part of it. What is interesting is that we don't really know the numbers, the exact numbers of slaves that moved from the Caucasus at the time. It was um, somewhat a sensitive internal matter often, and the refugees did not always disclose it to the Ottoman government. But there is one report that Tolidano cites, internal Ottoman report, that mentions 150,000 slaves which would make it somewhere between 10 to 20% of all North Caucasian Muhajirs in the Ottoman Empire, which is kind of mind blowing, it's a huge number. Um, and there is some consular evidence that supports this, that um, some villages, Kabardzin villages, Anatolia uh, had more slaves than, than freed people. Now, of course, when we say slavery, right, sometimes uh, the word serfdom is used as well. And that's because there are different categories of slaves in various North Caucasian societies. So 
some of them akin to brutal transatlantic plantation slavery, some categories are more akin to Russian serfdom and working for the master at certain times of the year. But perhaps it sounds like when, when these slaves crossed over to the Ottoman Empire, they were all assigned the legal category of Kölye, right, or kind of slave in, um, in Ottoman Turkish. So for some of them, it was a downgrade of, of their social status. Um, I do want to mention that there were slave revolts, something that we don't hear about much in, in late Ottoman history. They were, they, they were not massive slave revolts, they were localized, but entire you know, slave communities and entire villages would, would try to resist, would take up arms. And in most cases, the, government, the Ottoman government would take the side of their masters because they relied on the cooperation, right, with the leaders of, of North Caucasian communities to, to keep the order in the countryside. Uh, yeah, and um, you, you, you ask about gender. What I find fascinating is that I would argue that the immigration of North Caucasians in the Ottoman Empire, specific Caucasians in the early 1860s, helped preserve the institution of slavery, um, of white slavery in the Ottoman Empire. Because abolition was on the right. There was, with, from within the Ottoman Empire, by Ottoman intellectuals, there was also so much pressure to abolish slavery by the British. And in the 1850s, um, there were edicts abolishing slave trade of black slaves and white slaves, if not slave ownership. But then we have a massive Circassian refugee crisis. We have many people selling either their slaves or maybe their family members, that part is not clear, because they need to survive in those Ottoman ports. And so there's so many more sla slaves who used to be very expensive, right, Circassian slaves. There's so many more of them. There's an oversupply on the Ottoman slave market. And I think after that, the abolitionist efforts kind of are uh, very wobbly. Uh, we have a lot of consular evidence how Ottoman officials like just buy up dozens of slaves and then send them as gifts to dignitaries in Istanbul. So slavery became more of a upper middle class institution. There were so many more, um, so many more notables who were investing in preserving the institution after this refugee crisis. Yeah, thank you, Azad. Well, so uh, I think that this has been a really great discussion. Um, I wanna thank both uh, Vladimir Khamitransky and Eileen Kane for, for being with us today. And thanks to everyone for attending and for all the great questions that we got. Um, we couldn't get to all of them as usual, but unfortunately we're running, uh, we're out of time. Uh, I think that this was such a good discussion because of the way that we were dealing with broad, very broad issues and major themes. Uh, but with the kind of local and archival detail that both of you really bring to, to this work and that your work is really incredible for. So thank you again for that. And I just wanna say that um, our next uh, event in the series will be on Thursday, February 21st. Uh, sorry, no, Thursday, February 18th. Uh, and we'll continue the uh, sort of this story into the Soviet period with Sam Hurst and Masha Kirasirova on the Soviet Union and the Middle East. Uh, both so of them are, the, are here. Actually. Both of whom are here in, uh, in attendance. Uh, so we'll, I'm sure that there'll be a lot to say uh, on, on their topics and in connection to today's event. So thank you all again, unless there are any last words that you'd like to have, uh, I think we'll, we'll sign off for now. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having us. It's been wonderful. Always a pleasure, Eileen. Good to see you. Great to have you both here. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Great to have you. Thank you. Bye.